Hello and welcome to this second investigate session for the module policy and evaluation in public health. In this session we will look at the policy making process in detail. We will look at what is the policy process, what are the key steps in the policy process, what are the key theories, models that explain how policy making happens. Just a reminder that the yellow slides are the key slides, they're useful thinking about your assignment and again just don't copy them, think about them, reflect on them, really try and understand them and through that understanding analyse, evaluate and synthesise and apply the thinking uh, that emerges from looking at, at the concepts and topics that we are going to look at in this session. So what is the policy making process? Well, one definition that Booz, Mays and Walt have in their book, Making Health Policy, is that policy process is the way in which policies are initiated, formulated, developed, negotiated, communicated, implemented and evaluated. So looking at this definition, there are actually seven elements to it. There are seven words that describe what is the policy making process. It's about initiating policies, starting them. It's about formulating them, which is making them in terms of designing what will go into a policy. It's also about developing them and formulating and developing are pretty similar words and actually it's difficult uh, from this definition to see what the difference between the two is. So I think formulated and developed are probably the same thing essentially. Maybe one is on paper and one is then developing it with partners and stakeholders. Um, that could be one way of looking at it. And then the fourth word that's used in this definition is negotiated. So remember, policies aren't done in isolation. There's always negotiation at some level um, with some stakeholders. This could be negotiations within government. So for example, if we were the Department of Health and Social Care, we might negotiate with the Treasury for the money to, to implement the policy, um, or we might negotiate with the Department of Education uh, to because this is a project that will affect children that we might want to undertake in schools. So, and, and another example would be uh, negotiating with the Department for Environment where we might be looking at a um, policy around air pollution so we want to negotiate with them so in that context the policy may actually come from the department of environment but will have a big implication for health and well-being and ideally improving health and well-being if the air pollution regulations are are aimed at reducing the levels of air outdoor air pollution for example from cars or factories uh, or uh, aeroplanes or any other kind of emissions from any other kind of source. Policies also have to be communicated. They have to be communicated to a range of stakeholders, professional stakeholders, the people who might implement it, the people who might uh, be involved in uh, delivering, uh, monitoring and evaluating it, as well as communicating it to the public, you know, who will be affected by it. Yeah, that might be the whole public or that might be particular groups, you know, or particular communities uh, that might be affected by the policy. And the policy making process is also about implementation, actually implementing and actioning and delivering the project on the ground. How does a national policy uh, look like? How is it delivered at local level? That's a key thing because we might make policies at the national level, but it's often that the implementation takes place at the local level. And lastly, evaluation. So we're always aiming to try and monitor and evaluate policies. Monitoring, as we will look at later, monitoring <coughs> is about regular monthly, two monthly, quarterly 
monitoring uh, on an ongoing basis to see the uh, how well the policy is uh, being uh, delivered and whether it's achieving the aims that we hoped it would have. And evaluation often happens, you know, uh, at the end of the first year, at the end of uh, the third year, or the end of the fifth year. So that ha so evaluation does happen all the time. It happens at specific uh, intervals of time, and then you're looking at the whole policy and seeing where how successful or how unsuccessful or what parts have been successful uh, and what parts have been unsuccessful so no policy is wholly successful there's always elements that are not as successful and have not worked out as we would have hoped or thought that they would be uh, delivered or that would they would work So um, this is a general policy process or the policy cycle is another phrase that's used. Um, we will stick to the policy process, but you may see the term policy cycle uh, in the books and articles you might read. It's the same thing. They're talking about the same thing. And you can see the why they might call it a cycle because it goes in a circle. So it's like a cycle, um, like the water cycle or the air cycle or the carbon cycle. So in, in this very simplified version of the policy process, and one thing to remember is all policy process um, discussions, uh, explanations, um, uh, models, and this is a kind of model of a policy process, is necessarily simplified. It's not as uh, simple as this. Um, things uh, Policy making goes back and forth. It, it takes time. Uh, uh, sometimes you go back from one one stage to the other. So you instead of going from uh, policy identification as it is here to policy formulation, you might actually go from policy formulation back to problem identification. So let's start looking at this um, model uh, in its kind of simple form. So the first step in the, the policy process is recognizing that there is a problem, problem identification or issue recognition or also called agenda setting. So a problem is recognized, a problem is prioritized. Um, this might be prioritized because it's a big health issue. It might be prioritized because uh, people, uh, general public communities are very unhappy about an issue and want something to be done. Um, or it could be some other reason. Uh, businesses, for example, might be um, affected and so there may be economic implications so then politicians and civil servants in government um, feel that this problem needs to be addressed. Then the second stage is policy formulation and adoption. So in this stage the policy is developed, it's made, it's created, it's written up and then of course that policy is then uh, adopted formally by parliament and uh, uh, actioned at the third stage which is the policy implementation stage and in this policy implementation stage the policy is actually delivered on the ground in local communities um, the, if for example if that involves changing how things are done maybe having new structures new institutions and new people on the ground delivering something uh, then that is what the policy will do so for example we can think of uh, recently with the COVID pandemic we've got this contact tracing system and so there was a policy developed and then uh, ratified by parliament and then that policy was implemented on the ground so that there are places where people can get testing done and then there are people who have been ha recruited to uh, in call centers and elsewhere as outreach people to go and find people who might have been uh, uh, exposed uh, to COVID. Um, so this is what policy implementation means. It can involve spending, it does involve spending money, but it can involve also um, hiring new people. It can involve creating new uh, institutions, um, uh, new ways of working, new services at local level that weren't there before. And then lastly, of course, the policy evaluation step. 
where what we hope to do is to evaluate the policy in terms of how it was implemented and whether it achieved its goals to then feed back into the process. Hopefully we've resolved the problem, but if we haven't resolved the problem, then we need to relook at it and maybe change the policy. So we go around again, we say, is there still a problem? Has that problem not been resolved by the policy that we've just implemented? Then maybe we need to reformulate that policy. We need to change that policy and we need to make it better so hopefully we achieve the goals we set out for it. Now, this is more of what the public health policy process works. So where public health decides on its own policies um, within, let's say, the Department of Health and Social Care, uh, where no one else needs to be involved, then we usually start with assessing, analysing the population's health needs. That health needs assessment phase, that's the joint strategic needs assessment. It's what you talked about in assessing population health. So we look at the needs of the community. We also may do community consultations and other activities to find out what communities really want. And so in this phase, we work out what the problem is. And then once we know what the problem is or what we think the problem is uh, from a public health point of view, we then look at what options do we have. So we look at the scientific evidence, we look at community evidence, we look at other professional uh, experiences and evidence sources, and then we decide the types of we could implement. Because there's no one that is going to be the best fit. So we're going to decide on a number of possible po interventions that we could implement uh, that could achieve the goal that we hope, the aim, the objectives that we have for that policy. Um, and so we look at it, we look at the scientific evidence, uh, we look at uh, the, what the communities feel about the different types of options that we have available. Do they prefer one of them more than the others? And we look at what professional experiences and past experiences and past evaluations and other types of evidence uh, uh, from other stakeholders that might be useful in developing or choosing from or the options that we have developed. From that development of those initial the options and they're generally outlined, we detail those options and we then pr choose the, our preferred option. And that generally is the most cost effective option. Uh, the option that will be most effective for the least cost. All policies cost some money. And the question is, how much effect, how much improvement in health and well-being can we have versus how much we have to spend. And ideally we want to spend a small amount and get a big effect in terms of improving health and well-being uh, for the target community, the target population, the target group that we are interested in. Then, like the previous model, we implement that policy, we action it at local level or national level. Um, but as I said, even a national policy has elements that will be actioned at the local level. That's how all policies work. So we, if you have a policy that says at this time with COVID, recently the government has said that all pubs should close at 10 p.m. Well, yes, the government may say that, but who make sure enforces that that is actually happening that has to happen at local level that is local authorities the police service would have to make sure that pubs are actually closing at 10 p.m yet the government in whitehall in central london are not going to be going out themselves to go and check that every pub in the country is actually closing at 10 p.m that will be the job of local authorities environmental health officers and that will be the job of police services as well and then lastly, uh, similar to the previous uh, model, and we'll talk about comparing those the two models in a moment, we also then evaluate the policy. Now, with this model, if you can't find a source for this model, then you can reference the UWL teaching team, see the short guide to referencing for how to reference lecture slides. You can only use one set of lecture slides as a reference for every assignment. You can't fill the assignment with lots and lots of lecture slide references, but you can use one of them if you can't find us another source for this. Now, this kind of is a source for that public health model that we just talked about, the public health policy process, uh, this one here. 
So this is Satterfield et al.'s steps in the public health process. It's their version of what evidence-based public health uh, looks like. So again, they start with a community assessment, which is very similar to what I just talked about, which is analysing population health needs. And then they have a slightly different step. They talk about quantifying the issue and then three, developing a concise statement of what the issue or problem. So this is problem identification points two and three are problem identification, which fits in within the community assessment phase. That's where the data is gathered. And then we identify issues from that community assessment in, in stages two and three. Then we look at in stage four to what is known in the scientific literature about this problem, this health, public health issue. And then in five, we develop and then we prioritize or we choose a preferred option in terms of the policies and programs that we might choose to deliver. And then six is we develop an action plan and we imp implement the interventions within our policy. And then seven is evaluating the program or the policy. Now, in Satterfield, they talk about program and policy as equal, but generally policies are the higher level thing and programs come out of policies. So that's the best way to think about it, that policies are the big thing, the strategic thing, the high level thing, and then programs are one thing that come out of it. And, and for each program, there are a number of interventions within that program. So it's like policies at the top, then you have programs and then you have interventions below those. Yeah. And at each stage, they're getting lower, smaller and smaller and uh, affecting more specifically local communities uh, and local level um, populations. I'm hoping that you can see we, between the three models that there are a lot of similarities. There are some different stages, but there are a lot of similarities and overlaps. And it's really important to think and reflect why have Satterfield et al. decided that they needed uh, stages two and three, yeah, compared to what we can see in previous models. So here we're doing a little bit of a simple analysis and we'll try and do this in the next uh, apply session that we will uh, do uh, in class. Um, but let's start with a little bit just to get you thinking about what analysis is. So here we have the general policy uh, process model here. The problem identification and issue recognition and agenda setting policy formulation, policy implementation, and policy evaluation. And then on the other side, you've got the public health policy process, which is assess, analyze population health needs, assess potential policy options, develop detailed policy choices, implement the policy, evaluate the policy. So what are the similarities and differences between these two models? Well, first of all, problem identification and issue recognition is really very similar to assess and analyze population health needs. I hope you spotted that. However, what's the difference between the two? You know, problem identification and issue recognition is not the same wording as assess and analyze population health needs, but they're doing the same thing. They're finding some issue, some aspect that needs to, that needs a policy to improve it. Well, I think what you can say is that problem identification and issue recognition seems to be a very passive process. It's reactive, yeah? You're waiting for a problem to come uh, up. Uh, you're waiting for an issue to be recognized by the media, by local communities, uh, by professionals, by business, and then you uh, act on that problem once it's been identified. Assessing and analysing population health needs is, seems to be more proactive. I hope you f feel that it does, that yeah, you're assessing, you're actively going out and you're collecting data on a regular basis, yearly or monthly or quarterly, that you're collecting this uh, evidence and this information about needs, and then you're then trying to proactively identify potential policies that you can do something about. So that's one of the similarities. So there is a similarity there, but there's also a difference between the two two stages because of the wording of those two stages. 
then I hope you can see that policy formulation is very close to assessing potential policy options uh, uh, in the public health policy process model and stage three, the develop detailed policy choices and choosing the most cost effective option. And again, so those are the similarities. So in one of them, it's one step. In the other model, it's two steps. And I guess what you can say at a simple level of analysis is that the steps two and three are much more detailed. They give you details of what policy formulation involves. So yeah, policy formulation, if you don't know what it is, it's very difficult to understand what is involved in that. But in the public health policy process model, the stage two and stage three give you a little bit of a better understanding of what you're doing uh, uh, as part of policy formulation. And I hope you can see that the step three in the general policy process and step stage four in the implement policy in the public health policy process are similar. Yeah, they're just essentially the same words uh, uh, with one coming before the other. Yeah, one is policy implementation, the other says implement policy. Yeah, it's almost the same two words. And the same goes for evaluate policy and policy evaluation. Yeah, so very similar. There's no detail in either of those. And ideally, we want more detail about what we mean by these. What do we mean by implement and what do we mean by evaluate? So let's look a little bit more detail into the public health policy cycle or the public health policy process. So we assess population health needs, we assess potential intervention options, we develop policy choices, we implement policy and we evaluate policy. Now, please remember, as you can see, these slides are white, so we're not expecting you to describe all this in your essays, in your assignments. It's really important to be analytical. We, we assume that we know what these steps are. It's your job to apply these steps to the policy that you will be looking at in your assignment. So the first uh, step or first stage is assess population health needs. And we know what that is. That is essentially demography information, population dynamics, or population migration, age profile of a community, gender, sex profile of a community, how many ethnic minority communities there are, what percentages of ethnic minorities there are, how many, what percentage of older people there are. And so it's partly it's descriptive epidemiology, as we've looked at in terms of um, the assessing population health and joint strategic needs assessment, where we look at measures of health of the population. You know, we looked at health status, things like life expectancy um, and uh, mortality and morbidity uh, information such as uh, rates of cardiovascular deaths and uh, hospitalization for alcohol abuse, for example. We also look at index of multiple deprivation. We look at you know health inequalities through that index of multiple deprivation. And we also look at identifying trends and patterns. You know, is are things getting worse in an area? Are things getting worse? Are things improving in an area? And that trend and pattern analysis happens both at a national level and local levels. We then assess health risks and health needs. They're slightly different things, you know. Uh, health risks are things like obesity, so we know, uh, as I'm sure you've seen uh, from work you've done in previous modules, that obesity has been rising. It's stabilised over the last year or so, but it's still high and it's still growing. Um, and so that is an emerging health risk that we need to tackle. Health needs are often about linked to health services, though not always, which is about where we don't have a service to meet people's health needs, that they feel there's a need that they have um, that they would like help with. And that could be, you know, social isolation that for elderly people and that they would like uh, people to come and talk with them and spend time with them or for them to be able to go out to a day centre and have activities and socialise with other people. Um, or it could be a health need in terms of hospitals and doctors and GPs uh, and other health care and social care related services where um, communities, uh, individuals, families and uh, community groups feel that this health need has not been met. And 
fifth, we can identify priority targets. So we can look at finding what communities, what populations are being most affected uh, by some ish health issue, some public health issue, and that needs policies to be developed to support these communities. And then the second part is analytical epidemiology, which is again looking at, and it's this is the kind of scientific evidence that we might look at later about what are the causes at the individual and population level for the health risk, for the increases in deaths or increases in illness and disease in a community. And that's called analytical epidemiology. The second stage is to assess potential intervention options. We identify potential policy options. We look at existing scientific and policy and evidence and knowledge regarding the effectiveness of these interventions. We might even do new research to identify, we might do pilot studies in communities to test a potential policy option before we actually deliver it across the whole country. We then assess uh, through things like health impact assessment and policy impact assessment, assess the potential impacts of each approach. Yeah, Whether what the positive impacts likely to be of that policy option and what are the potential negatives likely to be of that potential policy option. And then uh, stage three is we develop policy choices and choose the most cost effective policy. So we look at the project impacts of potential interventions. So we will have a number of interventions in our policy. So then we will try and do some quantitative or qualitative assessment and potentially community to modeling and simulations of the impact of different uh, policy interventions that we might be using and the mix of interventions. So we'll use a range of different uh, interventions. So we might have a mix of different interventions in the different policy options. So for example, if we had policy option A, we might have interventions one, two, and three in that. And then we have policy option B. And in that we might have intervention one, and then intervention 10, and then intervention 11 in that. And then for or policy option C, we might have intervention one, intervention two, and intervention 10. So you might have a mix of different types of interventions in each of the policy choices that we could make, uh, thinking that different mixes of interventions may be more effective in some communities than others. We then go through a process, we and we as public health people will assist in a process of developing consensus around the policy choices that we have. So what we want to do is the final preferred policy option, uh, what we hope to be the most cost effective option. We do want consensus. We want communities to agree broadly. Yeah, We want uh, professionals who are involved in the process to th agree that this is the best way forward. Otherwise, we're not going to get buy-in. We're not going to get ownership of the policy. People will think the policy won't work. Uh, and they won't put effort into delivering that policy effectively. So we want to develop a consensus, an agreement between all the key players that's within government, uh, at local government level, and all the agencies. It could even involve business. So we want agreement for everyone as much as possible. Now, that's not always possible that we get total consensus and everybody agreeing, but we want as many stakeholders to agree uh, that the policies option that we want to choose and take forward and deliver is the best one at the moment that we are delivering and uh, that we're going on to deliver that uh, policy. And that's an important thing to remember that um, what is a good policy at this point in time a year from now, two years from now, 10 years from now may not be a good policy option to have chosen. So we do need to reflect and change and look at and monitor and evaluate the policy to change it if needed as circumstances, the social, political, economic, cultural, environmental uh, factors that may influence the policy change. And so then we ch look to change the policy. Stage four is implement the policy. So what we tend to do at this level is we have a kind of action plan, we've developed a strategy, and then we set targets for the chosen policy or policies. Uh, we do, we 
we do resource allocations, for example, for health services. So what we might do is to say, you know, if this involves new services and it just doesn't have to be health services, it could be social care services, it could be education services, it could be leisure services. So whatever the service is, we will have to give it a budget or more money or a different type of budget. We have to re reallocate existing monies, for example, um, or we have to give more money uh, for this new policy to be implemented at local level. And we often, at this implement policy stage, we develop information systems to collect information about the policy to help us to make sure that it is reaching the people that we hope the policy will reach and help to improve their health and well-being. Stage five is evaluate the policy. And this, again, we've you've talked about it, um, evaluating the impact and outcomes of the policy. So what are the immediate positive uh, impacts, the, the key things that happen immediately within the first year. And then outcomes are the longer term, three to five years after the policy has been implemented. What is happening? Is it achieving its goals? Is it continuing to achieve its goals? And then Lastly, we want to monitor future health and well-being as well, and this will happen continuously. So this is the difference between monitoring and evaluation. For monitoring, we look at uh, monitoring certain key health indicators, you know, every month, every two months, every three months, but evaluations don't happen at, on that scale. At the shortest time scale, it will be one year maybe six months, but generally it's one year, three years or five years or 10 years. It's that kind of uh, scale uh, because you, the evaluation is, is quite a, a, a detailed process. Monitoring is more of a light touch where you have a certain set of indicators. You might have five, 10, 15 indicators and those indicators you're following on a monthly, bi-monthly or quarterly basis to check that the policy it seems to be uh, uh, improving health and well-being in the communities that we've targeted. So now let's move on to how policies are implemented. Generally policies are actions through our action through documents and activities that are developed from the policy. And these usually f are for based or developed into action plans, programs and strategies. Now, strategies often are very close to policies, um, but they generally emerge from it. They're a more specific, more detailed version of the policy. Same with action plans and same with programs. All of these three things essentially are much more detailed versions of the policy. They set out what things or activities, what interventions will be delivered, how they will be delivered, where they will be delivered, when they will be delivered, and who will deliver them. Yeah. And so it's a much more detailed thing than what policies tend to be. Policies tend to be much more general, much more aspirational, much more setting out the direction that we want to go in. But they don't often tell you the details of how exactly the, the things that we want to do will happen at local level. So now let's move on to a couple of theories or models of how the policy process works, how policy is made. We're only going to look at two policies, but as I'm sure you've realised by now, um, there are many, many theories about how policies are made and how the policy process works. The two we're going to talk about in this session are the rational actor model and Kingdon's multiple streams model. And you can see uh, there is a, a reference given there as an example, and we will uh, potentially look at this in the apply session, or you can look at this in the consolidate session uh, as an application of Kingdon's multiple streams model. And I think the rational actor model as well is discussed in that uh, article. So the rational actor model essentially talks about everyone being rational. Yeah. And this model isn't really used, but if you think about it, we when people talk about policy, this is the model they're thinking about. So this model is not believed in anymore. 
because it is clear from everyday observation that people involved in policy making do not always act rationally and follow the evidence. I think you've seen that if you look at any policy making process, if you look at the current uh, pandemic, yet the way policy has developed has not been uh, completely rational and completely following the scientific evidence. And the rational actor model, therefore, is a model that says that we all behave rationally, reasonably, there's no emotion, uh, we all uh, get on well with each other, we all can see everyone's point of view, uh, and we don't have very strongly emotionally held beliefs, that we become angry about uh, certain types of policies, and we then, when we need to act on a policy and we need to deliver and design that policy, we all act rationally to... We all act rationally uh, in designing and delivering and taking up the evidence uh, to take forward and deal with a problem uh, that we find at a national level or a local level. The model is still useful and it's a good starting point for thinking about policy because much of public health theory and practice is often based on thinking like this, that everybody's rational, that individuals, communities, policy and decision makers are, are rational beings who will always do what is right from a public health point of view. Yeah, i.e. that they're going to be informed by public health evidence and what public health professionals think is the best way forward. The problem with this model is it often leads to disappointment because when public health issues or policies are advocated and not taken up by politicians or by local communities and wider public, we tend to think, why? Yeah, Why has this happened? Why are people not listening? Why are people not taking up the advice we're giving as public health people about what they should do to improve health and well-being at a national or a local level through policy making? And the reason is because we don't act rationally. You know, we have emotions, we have strongly held beliefs, and these shape how what we think is the right policies to be a country or a local a local government should be taking forward. So Kingdom's policy model is a really good model. It's a much more realistic model. And Kingdom identified three factors or three streams, and you can visualize them as three streams or rivers. Um, going along and at some point these th rivers intersect and it's only when these three rivers come together at the same point in time that pol there's a policy window opens up and that policy that policy that we're driving forward that we want to happen happens when only two streams or none of the streams uh, uh, touch each other and then policies then don't tend to be designed, don't tend to be delivered. And actually, that, that problem may not even be on the agenda for government. So his model is that only when these three factors come together is a policy issue taken up and policies are made. And so the three streams are the problem stream, the policy stream and the politics stream. So what is the policy stream? The, sorry, what is the problem stream? The problem stream is when an issue is seen as a big problem that most people see as a big problem. Yeah. So when people see, ah, this is a big problem, we don't like it, something needs to be done, then it comes onto the policy agenda. When the media, uh, when the news uh, uh, journalists uh, raise an issue and keep going on an issue, and then it becomes a bigger issue in terms of communities becoming aware of it, then politicians and civil servants in government uh, feel that yes we need to do something about it. The policy stream is where when the problem has a solution so one of the issues is that if a if a problem can't be solved can't be dealt with uh, in a good way then it's often if the problem isn't big enough then the problem will not will be ignored. Yeah, when we don't have a solution or a good way forward to deal with a, a problem, then often that problem will be left to one side. However, you have seen that a problem where there wasn't a solution, COVID, the pandemic, um, there, you know, that did come onto the agenda and that did action was taken on that. And the reason for that was the problem was a massive problem. 
So even though the policy stream in terms of having solutions wasn't there, um, the problem was so big that something had to be done. And you can argue that actually we did have the solutions because with SARS and with earlier H1N1 uh, virus uh, uh, epidemics in, in Southeast Asia, they in Southeast Asia, they had already developed some solutions for containing the problem. Yes, not resolving it, not um, uh, in, in immunizing people uh, uh, or treating them uh, in the early stages with uh, effective treat drug treatments but they did know how to contain it and reduce the uh, impact of spread and so this thing of contact tracing of locking down of uh, keeping children at home so there was a solution not the total solution we all wanted which was immunization and effective drug treatment so we could you know fewer people died and we would all be immunized so we could all go out and we wouldn't have to stay for six months indoors mostly and then the third stream is the politics stream. It's when major political party or parties that have the most power support the policy, then the policy and, and understand and recognize the problem, then it, the policy is likely to be developed and actioned. And hopefully in the uh, apply session, we will look at this in more detail and think about and, and apply this um, model uh, to uh, some realistic uh, scenarios. So this is a nice example. This is from uh, uh, Booz, Mays and Waltz making health policy diagram. So here it is. You can see here when the problem and policy uh, streams connect, there's no change. And when the politics and policy uh, streams connect, there's no change. But when the problem, policy and politics right at the bottom all connect and intersect with each other, then action is taken. Yeah, the policy window opens and there is a, a, there is motivation, there is driving forces that push uh, that problem, that policy forward, and that policy is then designed, delivered and implemented. So let's move on to the next point. It's part of the policy process still. So Kingdon's talking about this problem stream, uh, policy stream and uh, politics stream. But what are the factors that influence these streams, for example? Yeah, um, because it's not just those three things. There are other wider factors also involved. So there's so many of them. We're going to talk about five. Um, so there's many factors that influence policymaking. Uh, they can make an issue become important. They can shape how policies are developed. They can shape how policies are implemented. And they can shape how much time and money are spent uh, in delivering and designing that policy. Public health does influence policymaking, but is not often the most important factor. And that's important to bear in mind. So the most important factors that influence policymaking are powers, values, self-interest, social movements and public health. So power, we've talked about this in determinants of health, social power, the power that famous people have, uh, people like Jamie Oliver, who really pushed the obesity issue in schools and improved cooking and, and uh, food, lunch food in schools, is an example of famous people driving the agenda. Economic power, billionaires, uh, the big companies have a lot of power. They can push their agenda forward through government. And political power, being in government, is obviously important. If you have the most votes and you have the most MPs in parliament, Parliament, then you can push through what you want and what your agenda is as a government. Secondly, values. So there's a range of values, political values, faith values, ethical values and wider general societal values that everyone or most people in a society or the majority of people in a society hold. So these values can again drive policy making and the types of policies that are developed. Um, so, for example, we in Europe, we have a policy um, that sexual health education is important and that it should be done at an early age. We don't consider sexual health education to be something that leads to uh, a higher levels of sex in young people. We actually think that it benefits them and can even slow down uh, 
young people having sex and at least if where they do have sex then they have safe sex however there's much in other parts of the world and the US is an example there's much more of an argument about this um, where uh, there's a whole issue around whether you should be teaching that uh, whether that's an acceptable uh, approach to take and in places like the US uh, the approach to sexual health is simply abstinence yeah abstinence don't have sex that's the way that's what sexual health education should say unless you are married or in a long-term relationship self-interest is the third factor you know companies want profits they want to avoid losses families want tax cuts they want more services so our self-interest also drives policy making politicians self-interest in getting votes and staying in power drives the uh, policy making um, so self-interest is a very important motivator for what is done in policy making Social movements is the fourth factor. Public opinion, you know, when what is, was once seen as a minority opinion becomes a majority view, um, then policy shifts. So, for example, you know, we used to have um, a smoking inside public places, you know, in workplaces, in buses, in cars and in aeroplanes and in trains, anywhere where people were, you could smoke. And that over time, that majority opinion changed and became a minority opinion uh, where smoking now became unacceptable for the majority of people so where in the past majority of people accepted it, even if they didn't smoke that smokers could smoke inside uh, an office now it would be totally unacceptable for people to start smoking inside a room and now we have it that even in inside pubs and inside restaurants it's not an acceptable thing so social movements is a big a factor in driving policy and then lastly public health evidence of harms to people particularly lots of people and if a problem could affect the economy negatively or positively are drivers that's where public health you know where lots of people are harmed or where there's a potential effect on the economy then public health evidence tends to rise up the agenda and policy is made because the problem is seen as an important one that politicians and civil servants in government need to deal with Well, that's it uh, for this session. Uh, if you have any questions or observations or anything that's not clear, please write it down in the peer support forum or the Microsoft Word document that's been shared with you on Blackboard. And we can then discuss this in the apply session that we will have next. Please remember to do some reading, to look at the investigate, the apply and the consolidate sections and to do a few notes, uh, to look and do some Googling and look at YouTube. Uh, there are some already videos that we suggest, but you may also look wider. And think about what one thing you'll take away from this session and what one thing you didn't understand or find confusing. I hope you enjoyed this session and I look forward to talking with you in the next session. Goodbye.